Good evening, everyone. My name is Peter J. Thomas. I've been here before. Uh, I call myself the live bard. I've been traveling around for 17 years or so doing uh, recitations of narrative verse and some of my own stuff. Uh, we were asked by the hostess to uh, relate some story of the day, and it's curious that just haphazardly I called a former UMD professor of mine who is having his 95th birthday next month, and uh, he said to me, you were a philosophy undergraduate at UMD, right? And I said, yes. And he says, well, I've got just a quote from me. He said, he made me guess who it was, that the author was Schopenhauer. And I thought, after we hung up, I thought this might be an apt uh, intro to the poem I'm going to do tonight. Anyway, the, the quote was, life is our expiation for the crime of having been born. Schopenhauer, 19th century. The, uh, the tale I'm going to do is in the form of a letter. And uh, pardon what may seem like paternalism, but I'm going to give you a few words that you may not be familiar with. Um, one is antinomian, which is the Christian belief that faith alone, not obedience to moral law, is sufficient for salvation. Uh, theopathy is intention, religious, emotional devotion. Phlogitious is shamefully wicked. And another famous philosophy word from Germany is Weltanschauung, which means worldview. And lastly, another German word, Mensch. Uh, which is a sensible, mature, responsible person. This is called Method in Mookie's Madness. Dear Sir, I've been distinctly intrigued by your persona for some time now, ever since you opposed the U.S.-led invasion of your country, though your acquiescence back then struck me as odd because you and your Shia followers had been persecuted for so long by Saddam Hussein and his Sunni minions. And paradoxically, defense of one's homeland is a belief in total harmony with that of U.S. gun owners who argue that it's precisely the need for citizens of a nation to be able to repel an invasion, exactly the kind of offensive the American-led coalition undertook against you in Iraq that sustains the basis for the Second Amendment. But we'll skip that digression for now because it's you in which I'm most interested. After all, how many religious leaders since the Middle Ages have led their own army? And how many leaders of any yoke displayed the presence of mind that you did when, instead of racing to fill a gaping power void, you demurred? Yes, you shrewdly chose to pay the long game, enhancing your Shiite pedigree with lengthy study to become an Ayatollah, a task curiously undertaken in Iran, albeit a Syria company, but one with which in the 1990s, I'm sorry, 80s, your nation fought a long and bitter war. Yes, sir, I find you quite the savvy dude. And so what do you say, Mr. Al Sutter? What's the chance we could get together for a drink, just the two of us? I'm guessing that alcoholic spirits won't be on your preferred beverage menu, so maybe we could meet for coffee, some of that dense, sweet stuff flavored with cardamom that you probably like. How about a rendezvous at some sidewalk cafe, maybe lost in a crowd of some bustling Baghdad bazaar? Of course, I suppose you'll need your security deal, and so outside the green zone is fine because I'm sure that if I'm your guest, I'll be well protected by your Mahdi army. Where might we begin our little task, you may ask? It would seem we have one thing in common. We were both raised to believe in a supreme being, right? Each of us infused with an abominable faith in the purported existence of an all-knowing, all-powerful creator. Yes, as a child, belief in the big guy in the sky enchanted me. I remember at the age of seven, I partook for the first time in an enigmatic ceremony known as Holy Communion, 
and I experienced, I really did, the most profound sensation of bliss. By the moment the priest placed that unleavened disc of consecrated bread in my tongue, you know it was thin and brittle and tasted something akin to vanilla-flavored cardboard, which was okay because I hadn't been allowed to eat anything since the previous evening. And yes, I'd been counseled to allow the body of Christ to dissolve slowly in my mouth because the wafer was not to be chewed as that would have been deemed disrespectful and I had cannibalized the embodiment of the Son of God. Anyway, the moment I received that sanctifying host, I was filled with an exuberant theopathy that when the service ended, I raced to find my best friend John, proclaiming that I could feel God dwell within me and then pledged that henceforth I would emulate the virtuous lives of the saints and strive to act in the most exemplary manner. And for some years thereafter, such devotion underlay my every action, at least until adolescence arrived and I became routinely tempted by the dark side. But nevertheless, the point of this goody two-shoes tale is that I want you to realize that I get the God thing. I really get it, even if it's not your version of divinity. And so I'm keen to know how my warm, fuzzy, feel-good, fairy tale experience meshes with your religious upbringing, because you see, I know a little bit about your background. I've read that when you were the age of seven, your uncle Bakr, a notable Iraqi holy man, a grand Ayatollah nonetheless, was assassinated. It's rumored he was killed by having a metal spike driven into his skull, but not before he was forced to watch his sister first raped and then murdered. So please forgive what may be perceived as an untoward perversion on my part, but I wonder what your reaction was when you learned of these abominations, as I'm having a hard time seeing how a child who believed in the existence of the Almighty could comprehend the infliction of such malice by mortals such a deity had created. Although it must be disturbing, I'd like to understand, providing you accept those stories to be true, what it's like for you at night lying in the shadows, unable to sleep, dreading the arrival of that unrelenting demon who must appear, insisting that you visualize the final hours of your uncle's life. And because you must reflect on these evils, for how could you not, I wonder what discord such images have meant to your outlook on life. Maybe it's because I'm merely a credulous Westerner living a hyper-stimulated but vacuous lifestyle that's enveloped within our high-tech high fructose corn syrup, microplastic world, but I find it inconceivable that one person could inflict such horrors upon another. I've been bewildered for years by the taint and personalities that is required to manifest such blithe depravity. I've even entertained the vagary of being tortured, wondering what it'd be like to look into the eyes of the fiend who fastened wires to my extremities, who smiled as he switched on the electric current, who laughed at my contortions as my spine snapped. All this so I might grasp the level of cruelty attainable by a psychopath masquerading as a rational being. So I was hoping that you who has no doubt given this topic more contemplation than I ever could, would be able to help me understand how your uncle's tormentors could undertake such a flagitious act. Or maybe the more incisive question is, how have you resigned yourself to such act? Does the God you worship help you bear the unthinkable? Or does the cynicism of your own cherished beliefs sometimes creep into your soul and threaten schism between you and your God? Ah, yes, one's belief can become such irksome burdens because even when doubt finally pushes us to finally place God's ostensible, ostensible edicts in parentheses, do we each not trudge through life weighed down by a duffel bag of undetected inclination strapped to our backs? Do we not bear the behavior patterns extracted from childhood indoctrination, the remnants of which continue to shape, even dictate our conduct during our all too brief span of our frenetic earthly romp. In my case, it was my growing awareness of the shaky hold humans exhibit in understanding their own selves that led to my corresponding need to unify my own inner uh, untidiness. Yes, I saw the need to reconcile the deceptive gaps between what I felt with what I thought, what I thought with what I said, 
what I said with what I did. All this, mind you, while trying to make sense of the appalling naval ensemble of societal folly, and finally in my late 20s, inducing me to disengage from it the sultry well tanshong and embark on an introspective sabbatical to the supposed serenity of a simpler life as a ski bum in the Colorado Rockies. Which reminds me, I've read that when you were in your 20s, your father and your two brothers were murdered, gunned down in a daylight attack, allegedly on orders from your own government. Acknowledging that your family was of a different Islamic persuasion than that of the ruler at the time, America's old friend Saddam Hussein, will you be able to explain why the circumstance of him being a Sunni, as distinguished from you being a Shiite, is so critical to how each of you behaves on earth? Does belonging to one idiosyncratic sect supersede one's collective status as a mensch? Of course, now, as I ruminate on all this, it seems certain that your ways are far more forthright than ours. Yes, maybe it's Occidental society that is the anomaly. You have a life and death investment in your beliefs, unlike the rest of us who concern ourselves with reading pop-up news headlines on our smartphones, which may or may not have anything to do with life's turmoil, but more likely with a pending automobile Tyler sale or the latest upset in college football. Yeah, we in the West have a hard time getting excited what happened as far back as last week, unless it was a record number of hits received on our social media page. It's true, Christianity in our part of the globe isn't nearly as energized as Islam is in yours. After two millennium, what remains of our pliant religions is that the faithful blandly acknowledge that evil exists somewhere out there and meekly gloss over their moral frailty and simply accede to it. Yep, they pray for salvation, only to give in to temptation with impunity and then have the audacity to expect forgiveness. It's as though each of them had been given an anti pneumonia get out of hell free card. It's funny, too, because there's a lot of soul searching that goes on in that storybook we call the Bible that might serve as a model for accepting more personal responsibility. And there's a lot of civility there, too. People on record simply doing good things for others. Oh, sure, I know there's no guaranteed payback for self-altruism. It's based on charity, one of those many virtues which I, as a child, was socialized to strive for. Come on, Mook, you've certainly heard of the golden rule, right? Do unto others as you would have them do unto you? That's from the evangelist Matthew, writing six centuries before the prophet. Which reminds me, as you are reputed to have ordered the execution of any number of your opponents, and as you are a professed man of God, I am most eager to know how your view of humanity can reconcile itself to such bloodthirsty expediency. So what do you say, sir? I'd really like to share some time with you over coffee, because I think you... And I can help me figure out a lot of what's going on inside of my own head. Thank you. And very truly yours. A method in Mookie's Madness, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you.